I'm Annie Bergen. Maya Lin is one of the most prominent architect designers working today, and she's the subject of an Academy Award-winning documentary. Stay tuned for Lifestyles. Americans know Maya Lin mainly as the creator of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. Tonight, PBS is broadcasting the Academy Award-winning documentary, Maya Lin, A Strong, Clear Vision. Lin spoke with Bloomberg's Dan Thomas. Filming on the documentary took place several years ago as Maya Lin's career was becoming more inclusive, making art and architecture not only memorials. Maya says the documentary covered very well, very strongly the memorial and did an amazing job on closing that chapter. I asked her if she attempts to articulate a particular message in her memorials. Each one was very different. So with civil rights, it really was me asking the question, what would I want to do here? And I wanted to teach people a little bit about that era. It is very much an educational tool. But in the public artworks, such as her clock in New York's Penn Station, she is trying to make people aware of their existing surroundings with the work responding to the location. She was a young college student more than 15 years ago when her design proposal was chosen in an anonymous contest for the Vietnam Memorial. She was unprepared for the abusive opposition to her idea. Some groups mistakenly thought... I was trying to do something against the veterans, and that was the farthest thing from my mind. I was frankly making something that would make us accept and then come to terms with death or a loss. Some of the opponents of her Vietnam memorial were troubling on a personal level. God, I think the, one of the more hurtful things was people were angry that a gook had designed the memorial or that one prominent person who was opposed to the piece called me a fortune cookie. I was shocked. The undertakings on her plate now include houses in New York State and Connecticut, a recycling plant for the South Bronx in New York City, and a revitalization project for downtown Grand Rapids, which reflects her thoughts on bringing life back into the cities. I'm Dan Thomas. Starting in 88, 89, I was really beginning to make solid progress in both art and architecture. But say I did a one-woman show at the Wexner Center that didn't make it into the film because at the end, timing was running out. So that there was a lot that really has shown more developed work that she wasn't able to catch because of the time frame she worked. So from an artist's point of view, I think I could have said, oh, let's wait and let's capture some of the later work and it would have been a lot you know more what my idea was but that would be my film so to speak is it like a musician saying well my first album was what i was into then but i'd rather you look at what's happening now this is where i am today uh i don't think it's like that i think it's more that um i after doing the civil rights memorial i decided i wouldn't do any more memorials i didn't really want to get typecast so i proceeded to start into art and architecture and um of those projects, the ones that she caught were the absolute first ones, and that there have been, well, Groundswell she caught, but basically there have been a few others that I would have loved to have had included. But timing wouldn't have allowed it. We'd still be filming. I think artists are always pretty preoccupied with what they're immediately working on. I did want to talk a little bit about the memorials, and uh, I wondered if you think about trying to communicate a very specific are you really trying to articulate a special thought to a viewer when you're putting these memorials like Vietnam together? Uh, or I think somewhere you were quoted as saying that you don't try to tell people what to... Well, right. let me not put words in your mouth. Okay. Are, are you, are you I trying think, to... I think, okay, the memorials are very, in a way, very loaded design projects. I can't even call them that. The intentions of both the Vietnam and the civil rights are fairly complex. Each one's different. I think the best I can say is that whenever I go into a project, um, I'm trying to learn as much about the aspects of the site, the cultural context. So for the Vietnam, I mean, it, I even hesitate to go into it. I think the film talks about the civil rights in the Vietnam very well. But each one was very different. Say, for instance, with civil rights, it really was me asking the question, what would I want to do here? And I wanted to teach people a little bit about that era. It is very much an educational tool. 
Now, going into Penn Station and doing Eclipse Time, making a sculpture and outdoor artwork installation, those pieces are not inherently politically loaded. Like, say, the memorials are really about history of some sort. And so for me, the aim is to teach or account for a truthful accounting for history. So what you were about to quote was, yes, I like to present the facts and allow people a place to think. In other works that are really the sculptural, outdoor, the public artworks, what I'm trying to do is, one, make people very aware of their existing surroundings. The works respond very much to that physical site. They with Eclipse Time, it's in Penn Station. People are very much involved with commuting in time. I made a clock. And the clock is something that in order to look at it, you have to stop still for a moment in your busy, hectic day, look up, and maybe you'll notice it change a little bit. So fundamentally, what is that one doing? Trying to ask people to take a little bit of time off to be more aware of their surroundings. Civil rights in Vietnam are much more focused on specific historical events, and they really were. In a way, I see them as, as, as teaching tools, or the civil rights is the Vietnam. It really was trying to really factually, I mean, I, I actually can't get into it in such a short conversation, but it, it really, the, I think the movie really, really very well accounts for the processes I went through in those two, in those two pieces. Clearly, you were not ready for the opposition that you faced. You were a kid at that time, really. Yeah. Uh, but what aspects of that hue and cry do you think were the most um, surprising, painful for you? Um, I think, frankly, when when different veterans groups tried to turn it and galvanize it into a situation with, where it was artist or art versus the veterans, like I was trying to do something against the veterans, and that was the farthest thing from my mind, that I'm trained as an architect, and what I'm very interested in is the psychological or experiential qualities of a work, and I was frankly making something that I knew would be cathartic, that would make us accept, and then come to terms with death or a loss or a very painful situation. So I think the greatest pain was for um, the veterans to be incredibly distrustful and um, also I guess the um, the racist aspect of it really when I realized I, I was so naive I didn't even realize that was part of the problem Oops, doorbell I think the other thing that really I was very naive about when I was first selected was whether my ethnic identity would play into it and um, when I realized much later in the game that people were angry that a gook had designed the memorial or that one prominent person who was opposed to the piece um, called me a fortune cookie, and that showed up in a, in a comic ad, I think, I was shocked. I was horrified. That I, didn't even occur to me that, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically I was a kid from Ohio. It didn't occur to me. You know, I had not come across racism. I guess I was lucky. And maybe you can say you're lucky that you can go through like 18, 19 years of your life and not come across that. Um, but it also left me, in a way, unprepared for when I did realize that people were very, some people were very upset. You did the civil rights material, and what's the thing here in New York, the... Uh African-American... Uh, Museum for African Art. Yeah, now, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're, you're not black, but they sought you out. Right. Um, yeah, they did. I think um, I think with the Museum for African Art, it was really about an intuitive response and the fact that in my work, in the affinity I have, the aesthetics worked with um, designing a, a, a museum for African art. I wasn't trying to imitate or mimic. It was just that my aesthetic, which deals with a lot of natural materials, a lot of intuited, hand-drawn spaces, um, worked very well. And the director felt that the body of my work sort of lent itself to to that design. Can you mention any of the projects you're on now? Obviously, um, you've been in yeah. a lot of meetings today, so that there must yeah, be several things. Yeah, meetings today. There's several architectural projects that are going up. A house in Connecticut, a private residence in New York. Um, 
a recycling plant for the South Bronx, and a sculpture for the Cleveland Public Library, one I just completed for the Rockefeller Foundation, and I think I'm, I'm also working on a project for the city of Grand Rapids, which will be a sculpture, but also an urban revitalization of their downtown area. So it's a meeting of art and architecture in a downtown city. Will it be intended to generate commerce? I think it will be meant to relive in a downtown area. It'll be um, an ability to take an area that is not used that much anymore and bring it to life. So there'll be a park, um, an amphitheater, a skating rink. So I think it's really, for me, it's about bringing people together. Is this uh, sort of a classic textbook case of urban blight, or is it just sort of desolate and underutilized? It's a little bit of a case where... The downtown area has sort of been drained due to the move out to suburbia, and it's how can we bring these cities back to life, which really plays into my attitude and my concerns for the environment that we have to start condensing and really beginning to use and rework our cities and to bring life back to the cities and to not keep spreading out into a mall culture, a suburban sprawl culture, that I actually am very concerned, having grown up in a small town, to see it blossom into one, two, three malls, one after another after another, and that we really should be more conscientious about conserving our resources. I was curious, really, just about your use of space, sort of the integration of people with the space. Do you bring sort of the same dynamic to the structure when you're designing a private facility as you do when you're designing something for the public? I think the lot, there are a lot of like, well, there's a big difference, I think, between how I deal with the art and architecture. Um, a lot of it dealing with just what, what the two creatures are as far as artistic license and all that, but I think there's some real similarities, and I think I tend to make, both in the sculpture and the architecture, journeys or paths or experiences. So say the Weber House, which was shown, is sort of based on a Japanese courtyard, and you get to walk through the house, and it's not really a series of discrete rooms, but overlapping rectangular spaces that flow from one to the other. So both in the art and the architecture, there's sort of the feeling of passage and um, and movement through a space as opposed to I'm making it like a discrete object or a discrete room. And that follows me throughout. Overlapping rectangular... Well, it, it's, it's sort of a complicated thing to describe. I'm trying to say that house is a courtyard house that wraps itself around an internal stone courtyard of which as you walk through it's very much like a Japanese garden house where as you walk through the space you're very aware of the outdoor spaces too the gardens gardens are in a way framed by the house and so the house becomes a vehicle to pay attention to what's going outside so there's a real connection between landscape and house it's not like say you make a square closed box and throw it down into the middle of the woods the box opens up and how you walk through the house reveals what the landscape is so there's a real close tie and a real respect for the landscape when you're in the house and it, that relates back to the roof itself which really is a mimicking of the roof of, of um, the terrain it's surrounded by so there's that one scene of me walking on the top of the roof it's as if I'm walking on on, on the land itself well okay <laughs> Suppose um, I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does, but I just wondered then if a client comes to you, and it, one client says, I want a dwelling that is integral with the surrounding terrain, you would take that approach where it, it sort of moves you from inside and to outside where the environment is part of the structure versus if somebody said to you, what I'm really looking for is shelter in the conventional sense, would you then take a different approach? Would you make a box. Well, no, I think, I mean, everything in that sense is a contained unit, so they are boxes. I think my approach in architecture, what I would say to someone is, well, the work that I do is very science-sensitive. Um, there's a definite aesthetic in the work in that it always uses natural materials. There's a lot of play with light, natural colors and woods, glasses, metals. Um, I am out of a modernist aesthetic. So if someone came and said, well, I want 
like a Tudor house. They're not going to get as contained a house as they might if they went to someone who, who designed houses that were much more, say, traditional New England salt boxes. No, I probably wouldn't do that. I am working with a client now where we're working on a, um, a very vernacular style it's fitting into a couple hundred acres of farmland, and I'm working off of a very simple tobacco barn type, the elongated simple barn shape, but it too, how it sits in and the foundation of the house cuts into the landscape again, begins to play with how, how it relates. A lot of it depends on what the site is and, and who the clients are, but my houses tend to begin to have a certain look to them. Suppose somebody wanted you to build a mobile home or a rock group wanted you to design their touring bus and you were forced to deal with confinement. Uh, oh, I could have, I would actually have, I mean, the idea of designing a mobile home is, is a beautiful little design idea. But what you would do with it is a whole other issue. When songwriters talk about other songwriters, the, the highest compliment they could pay to another songwriter is to say, wow, I wish I had written that song. <laughs> Whose work over the years have you looked at and said, wow, excellent? Oh, there's this incredible house on a cliff side called the Villa Malaparta, which is built into a cliff. And you talk about architecture blending in with its environment, and yet in a way like the like certain Greek temples, really commanding a space. That is just one of my favorite buildings. The work of Louis Kahn and Louis Bergon are also both amazing architects to me. And the artist Richard Serra. That's some work I just really, really am inspired by and love, as well as Robert Smithson, who did the spiral jetty out in um, Salt, the Great Salt Lake, who was one of the first artists to really move art out of the gallery and engage the land. When you were a kid mm -hmm. uh, and you were first thinking about design and architecture as a possible career, what kind of fantasies did you have, in other words, where your career might take you if things could take you where, exactly where you wanted to go? What did you think about then? I think I was enamored with um, the architect Frank Lloyd Wright because he was able to blend the architecture in with the design of the interiors. I mean, he really incorporated both the architecture, the chairs, the furniture. It was almost an all-inclusive process, and he was one of the first people I really admired, and I think I kind of wanted to do that, and I think so. A lot of the houses that I do, I end up designing most of the furniture within it, and um, it's sort of the, the lines between the architecture, the landscape, and the design of the furnishings inside all come together, so it's an all-inclusive design theory. I knew there was Frank. In that little <laughs> bit of, of the house of yours that was shown in the film, I said, yeah, there's something yeah. about this that... It's, that says, it's, I was actually going to mention that, because he is, if you talk about those that do contained rooms and those that really created spaces that flowed, Wright is one of the greatest. And yes, I absolutely take inspiration from him.